By the time the prisoner had been taken back to her new accommodations, several very large-scale items have been happening. Major things have been happening, actually. And they're all across the planet at all different levels. First was the fight on the shoreline. It had gone so much better than everyone figured. Though they knew that the enemy did not like water, still, no shore defense worth a dog vomit? Holy jeez, that was simple. At this point, ships easily controlled the oceans as they realized nothing could face them out there. They started doing what sailors are trained to do in that situation. They supported the land operations once the oceans were completely cleared. The submarines had basically cleared the area anyway, but still... Having the big guns was a very, very good thing. The carrier groups had finally arrived in earnest and got rather close to the shoreline. Even decommissioned carriers were brought in and were running operations 24-7. To accommodate this, hundreds of thousands of supply ships, military and civilian, were constantly running food, Extra water, parts, weapons, medical hygiene, fuel was a major one. All constantly being loaded onto military ships to keep up the bombardments and keep those birds in the air. Battleships, though they had to be recommissioned, were still firing constantly. One even flooded its booster tanks on one side so it could elevate the weapons to strike deeper into enemy territory. Everyone that saw this would take a picture and send the caption, Really? Again? The main guns were making very, very short work of anything they found. The forward observers were paramount to this, as each one of them would find each of these positions and rain all sorts of holy hellfire down on them. Once known targets were destroyed, they would seek out any additional targets of opportunity they could find. The airborne that came in were finally on the ground, only a few hours before the landings even took place. Those on the ground rallied to their positions as soon as possible and began taking out their primary objectives. However, they had no problems taking down a target of opportunity at any given chance. They did this with extreme prejudice. Any enemy aircraft that was able to make it into the air was immediately shot down by fighters that were close by. They immediately locked onto it and gave it a few guided missiles right into the cockpit. If not, those on the ground that carried guided munitions would simply launch them into the aft quarter. In other words, they shoved it up their butt and watched as these VTOLs usually simply tumbled and spun out of control and crash landed right before they exploded. Usually this came with the chant of the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. Yet this was always halted as this would give away their position by screaming so much. Those who had jumped in had very specific targets they need to get to. Main supply depots, communication towers, basically anything they could find to cause absolute chaos. At that moment, they were agents of chaos. Doing this aided the landing forces as they showed up to nearly empty beaches because there was no counter batteries. There was no communications going out. There was no aircraft to strafe them. They didn't mind that they didn't have a problem on the beach. However, they were a little upset. They couldn't just simply go in like the old days under sorts of fire, but they knew they had a mission. They could begin to offload the heavy equipment and personnel a lot faster on an empty beach and not have to worry about something blowing up next to them. Old transports ran themselves right onto the beach, along with newer transports simply rolled out of the water. Some older machines were even brought back into service to get this job done. Within minutes of the first vessels reaching the shores, the area was saturated for 10 to 15 miles on either side of each battleship of waves upon waves of humans and machines all wanting a piece of the enemy. Hell, not just a piece, they all wanted the same thing. They wanted to make the grass grow by spilling as much enemy blood as possible. 
this was the only thing on their minds. In the skies, the humans' atmospheric fighters raised supreme above everything else. They had to steer clear of the naval bombardment, of course, and the cruise missiles coming through. The Rapid Dragon is no joke. However, once those bombardments, cruise missiles, and everything else struck in, they were able to go deep into enemy-held territory for the next phase and the next phase line. They also had to make sure of one particular item was hit. Their targets, most of them, were much deeper inside the territory. Their primary target above all else was the spaceports. Stealth aircraft made quick work of any enemy fighters and SAM systems that were there. This allowed the heavier fighters to deliver their payload. Payloads far too heavy for the stealth aircraft to actually carry. However, each one of these, if struck, would cause massive damage. Diving in, they aimed for the large shuttles, corvettes, and the two large frigates that were parked trying to power up themselves. The large bunker buster bombs penetrated the hulls. There was no exception to this. It just punctured through them like they were made of tinfoil. The internal explosions that came caused even the engines to go critical. As fire burst through the holes and sometimes blowing entire hatches off, it was clear to see that the engines were going to go critical soon, so everyone banked away. Thankfully for the enemy, they had their own safety systems, and this would allow the engines to shut down to make sure the whole thing didn't just explode in a gigantic, almost nuclear fireball as the engines would go critical and simply explode. The issue was, once they shut down the engines and tried to fix the hole, they were left defenseless. They had no engines as they had to stay powered down or risk them blowing, which meant the weapons were down, and hell, not even the doors would open and they would have to be cranked open manually. The enemy would not be able to receive reinforcements as they had absolutely no place to land them safely. If they tried, they would simply set the ground on fire and they wouldn't be able to disembark or they would land someplace where there was a giant rock that would rip into the hull itself or, God help them, tip over the ship itself causing everything to go sideways really quick and literally. Though it wasn't going to matter. The moment the ships in orbit seemed to realize what may be happening, they found themselves action-packed with issues. The hackers had all come together, and with all crimes pardoned, they were very happy to help with their plan with a remarkable, simple, but also very complex plan. A small team had stuck in and placed specific set of devices on the enemy's own communications equipment on the ground. This communicated directly to the hardware inside the ships. Once the hardware was in place, the hackers could conduct their own type of bombing. They were going to e-bomb the entire fleet. The systems of the ships out in orbit were flooded with strange items that seemed to pop up on their screens constantly, jumping up in front of them, keeping those on board from even being able to see their own monitors as many of these strange images would simply come up pop up in front of them more over and over and over again to the point where they tried to figure out how to remove them they found out that yes you could remove each one quickly by hitting this small little strange symbol in the corner yet it seemed like even more and more were coming up even if they could clear that the database was suddenly overloaded with human mating rituals. They couldn't understand what was going on. Most people learned about this plan and didn't know the hackers could pull anything off really. But then you would see them smile, that strange odd smile, and giggle, that same giggle that every human would do when they know they're getting over on somebody. And when they said they would simply fuck up the enemy forces, well, nobody realized they meant that literally. As it turns out, there was another level of what they were doing to the enemy ships. The files and files of porn would immediately clip themselves to parts of the enemy database. As the enemy began to remove the infected files, they would find that several areas of their own system was being deleted as well. They didn't understand it until large sections of their data was just lost. 
before they even realized it, the programs running the ship were just gone. Automated systems that kept the ship in orbit, that kept it running, were just gone. Everything would have to be switched over and run manually now. The helmsman started going absolutely nuts trying to keep the ship in orbit as they had to try and run things manually, which they had only had a cursory class on back when they were initially getting their training. Fire control had to unload weapon systems to keep them from firing prematurely, and everybody knows how bad a premature detonation can be. And nobody at all wanted to even think about how bad it was going in the engine rooms. Without the ability to use their own devices to communicate, they tried to use the remaining human devices that were left in orbit. Too bad they were basically in sleep mode, as there was absolutely no reaction from them at all. To activate them, though, you needed a code, and they had no idea what it was. And with their systems shut down, there's no way they can just run through thousands and thousands of lines of code at once, trying to get the right one. Many of the captains began to freak out asking how long until they got caught up in the planet's gravity well. For almost half of them, six out of the 13 invasion carriers that were still up there, it was already too late. They began descending towards the planet. With minimal and manual controls, they tried their best, but while the rest of the crew headed for the life pods, the command crew had to stay. They wanted to see if they could salvage the ship trying maybe they could land it maybe they would be able to somehow figure this out they knew that if they could land the ship at least they would be able to preserve it at least they could hold some of their pride and have a little bit of honor left in there across the planet large ships screamed through the atmosphere to their credit almost all made a successful crash landing the issue was now they're stuck they're on the planet with a busted ship. They can't even open their weapons lockers. Now, now what the hell do they do? By the time the first enemy carrier crashed onto the planet, human forces had already pushed further and faster than anyone up in space had anticipated, even those on the ground. The enemy knew that this was a hardy species they were going against, but this was absolute beyond comprehension how were they able to do this how could they do so much in such a fast time with such limited tech technology they've even limited themselves how are they able to just keep going this was crazy they weren't even able to adjust their own defenses before the same crew that had struck them before was already in another position firing down on them how were they doing this as the prisoner was being taken to the holding area, the one in charge was receiving reports. He smiled with a predatory grin that made her a bit nervous when she saw it. This was something that she had learned that humans do naturally. It wasn't always something mean, but it was enough to make her nervous. They left her in the care of the medical staff as he walked away. Across the entire Western Hemisphere, everybody was getting the same news that they were getting in that facility. The human forces have neutralized the enemy space fleet, and they were warned, Beware of falling Xenos. Capture, if possible. Which was very much a hint, as everybody on the ground, if they hadn't loaded their long guns yet, was already doing so. Just in case they found a few that were on the ground from life pods or maybe a crash landing, they weren't going to even think about giving these split lips a chance. At this point, humanity owns the air. Those vessels in space are now unable to fire down on them to disrupt anything. They aren't able to stop those on the ground either. This was the only thing that was stopping all of them as they could not fight back into space. The few missiles that they had shot up were enough to dissuade most of the ships from getting close to certain areas, those that still had intact militaries. However, it was not enough to get them away from the planet enough that they wouldn't respond to a ground invasion. Speaking of which, 
On the ground, the landings in Colombia and Venezuela had been a resounding success. So much so that they're pushing the enemy hard south. The armor brigades have now passed the Panama Canal and should soon be making their way to Colombia. The only thing slowing down their assault right now is simply terrain, as the enemy is no way of slowing them down at all. They don't have enough forces down there. They have nothing that can punch through the hull of a tank. And now that they don't have air support or anything in space, there's nothing they can do to stop the armored advance. Those split lips who stay behind and try to fight find themselves at the wrong end of a 50 cal coax or a 105 main gun. Almost all the enemy resistance is in the equator has been silenced. Enemies are trying to regroup inside the rainforest, which is not the best of ideas, with all their supply lines cut and down to a few small arms, they had to resort to hand-to-scale fighting, if you want to call it that. And this was scaled back, no pun intending, consider the invaders. Everyone cheered around the world as they heard this. The same scenario was taking place on several locations around the world, Everyone believed that if this kept going, if our fighting men and women out there succeed, which they should the way things are going, then they might have just relieved themselves from the occupation. Maybe, just maybe, they have a chance to get free. All the way at the newly built stations that were designed to siphon off all the resources from the planets in the soul sector along with their accompanying vessels. They had no idea what the hell was going on. All they knew is that the ships near Earth and Luna had gone dark. Magnifying images, they see ships tumbling through the atmosphere. This was impossible, they all thought. But they had no idea what the hell those hairless apes could have done to defeat the ships. And this confused them. They sent a few ships to get close to try and re-establish some sort of communication. But as they called out, some of their own vessels just suddenly started to go strange. The others who had sat back and waited as they sent the smaller vessels watched as several little ships just simply went adrift. This is horrible. What the? What's going on? With their systems shutting down, the ships essentially went dark as well and simply drifted through the ether of space. This was worse scenario above everything else. If they couldn't get their engines running again, there was only two things that were going to happen. They were either going to crash on the nearest planetoid once they got caught up in its gravity well, or they were going to drift off and either die of suffocation, dehydration, or malnutrition, each of which is very painful. They all saw this. Those who were still by their stations, they saw what was happening every time someone tried to get a hold of those ships in particular around Earth. They were so scared that they ran. They're not warrior cast. They cannot stick around. They're going out. They're gone. On the ground, the platoon sergeant has been in the fight for over a week without much rest at all. In fact, most of his men have barely slept at all over the past eight days. He and his men are tired, dirty, hungry, constantly just thirsty as all hell. But they just keep going. They grab rides when they can from any vehicles heading their way, but usually have to jump off about halfway there, so their next objective is not exactly close. The vehicles are having trouble in the terrain as the foliage is so thick, but any of them that get close, it's a wonder to have them. The only issue on the ground is, well, they didn't have much to do once the flyboys got their shot. It was almost insulting here. What was worse was the artillery pukes. Everybody remembered, don't call artillery unless you want to kill everything. And that's exactly what they did. The majority of the movement, they would head over to their objective, but time to time they got there, it was just a smoldering heap of what was left as 
parts were all over the place. The artillery guys just love using that HE as they dropped it down and blew everything to pieces. Only a few times did they have to actually engage directly, mainly to take out a retreating force, but hell, they didn't have any problems shooting these fuckers in the back. Although twice, they did find humans that need to be freed. These prisoners looked like shit. They were very malnourished, extremely dehydrated. And when the stories of what had happened to these prisoners and what they had seen, oof, it was enough to drive them, to fuel them with hate. The enemy would tire quickly as they chased them into the wood line. Those running away couldn't understand how the humans could just keep coming. Do not they not ever tire? They never seem to stop their advance, ever. If they are down stopping, it means that they're leveling their weapons at them. Those that wanted to surrender ended up being shot by their own leadership, as it was a sign of dishonor to them. The last thing they ever heard before the shot was, You will not embarrass or defy me. Usually that was before the energy pistol was discharged. However, these energy pistols were not exactly silent either, and this drew humans towards the location. Towards the end of the campaign, after the split lips had tried to survive in the Brazilian rainforest, which was not exactly a smart idea, as everything there is there to bite, sting, scratch, infect, poison, or in any other way, shape, or form kill you, the platoon had stumbled across what was left of the forces there. They weren't alone either. The humans had linked up with several other platoons as well. In fact, the few remaining split lips were facing off against an entire battalion at that point. One of his squad leaders ran up to him and told him they had found the snake's commander. As he walked over, the snake was laying on the ground, still clutching his pistol, but they could see that the damn thing was empty as it was blinking a strange purple color, which was indicative that they were completely out of energy. It was looking up, scared, surrounded by human. As the platoon sergeant walked up, he could see there was a trail of dead Columbra just there. He looked, and he could see most of them had been shot in the back, but not by humans. The enemy commander was still holding that energy pistol, clutching onto it with a death grip. The platoon sergeant was able to get a hold of one of the translators, and he got the story from their commander. Though broken, the platoon sergeant could make out the story and figure out what the hell this snake in the grass was actually saying. As it turns out, he shot his own men for wanting to surrender, many of them simply walking away saying they're done with this crap. And now, this snake wants to surrender. The platoon sergeant thinks for a moment speaks into the device and presses enter. The snake hears the broken sounds of his words translated, as the translators haven't been able to actually figure all this out now. You kill own. Desire live. Reason honor pride. You no honor. Shame you. Betray. Die. No honor. The snake realized what was about to happen as his eyes got wide, as with a simple motion, everyone around him leveled their weapons and began to empty entire magazines and belts into the bastard as he laid there. Everybody realized what this thing had done by betraying his own, and that is not something soldiers ever let happen, not without reprisal, of course. As each of the human walked away after replacing their magazine or putting in a new belt, they simply spit on the body before they walked away. Deep inside a facility all the way on another continent, a particular female snake is being tested. Tested to see what type of food she likes, what she actually can eat. 
which one she prefers, of course, is what they're interested in. They bring her different drinks and try to figure out which one she likes. She looks at them, almost surprised that drinks actually have flavor. They joke because they have to put in so many flavor packets before she actually has some sort of reaction at how good it is. On top of this, blood is taken, which makes her nervous at first until they realize they're only taking a few vials, not actually draining her. She wasn't so happy about the small bit of hair being plucked off of her head. However, it seemed as though they were interested. They wanted to know more about her. They also pulled a couple of scales, which were very unpleasant, and she had to be held down for that one as she thrashed around a lot. The scales being pulled off is just as bad as having a whole bunch of hair ripped off the human head, or other hair pulled off of other areas. She was brought to several machines over the course of the few days that seemed to scan her in different strange ways. Though communication was difficult, they did make do. Not all the tests were pleasant, though. In particular, the probe that went down her mouth and into her throat was very, very unpleasant as the probe seemed to expand a little bit as it went down her esophagus. Also, they varied the heat and the cold inside her chamber. This was not something she enjoyed being cold-blooded. She did enjoy the heat, though, at least for a while, until it got very unpleasant. Another part that was unpleasant was the fact that they seemed to keep wanting more blood. They never took a large amount at a time, as it seems as though they realized that she was very malnourished. But it seemed like every few hours they wanted more. She also did not enjoy the fingers and probes in areas she did not want them to enter. In some cases, it was also quite painful. Her only true solace came from the little things. So much fluids, more than she could even drink, yet she could have as much as she want. So much food, that as soon as they figured out exactly what she could eat, she got as much as she wanted. And of course, the mostly comfortable resident. It became far more tolerable when they brought a new bed in, one that was large enough for her entire body, and also it was heated. Another bonus was the human females that always seem to be around. They always have their devices on them. These she recognized as a type of recording device for her speech. She figured it was to help translation as they kept trying to figure out different words and phrases that she was using. The translation was getting better, just very, very slowly. A few days after she had arrived, she thought, I wonder how long I'm going to be stuck on this planet. Though they have been very nice, I would like to return. I mean, my bonding is important. It's all important. And just as she finished this thought, alarms started going off and personnel started scurrying around like crazy. She didn't understand, and she looked out the large window, and she tried to figure out what's going on, but she couldn't figure out the language, not yet. They seemed scared. She could hear, it's coming through the atmosphere, and it's going to crash close. How close? Really fucking close! The carrier crashed a few seconds later, just a few kilometers away from the facility. The facility shook enough that it knocked almost everybody off their feet. The prisoner giggled as she was completely stable on her coils. She watched as they began to get up after everything had happened. Then suddenly a second rumble which seemed to shake the building but not knock everyone off their feet this time. She didn't realize that what had happened was the crash and the second rumble was the ship's weapons cooking off blowing the entire hull to pieces. After that second shake, the prisoner thought to herself, Wow, they got here fast. They must be coming to get me off this rock. Which is good. I don't want to be late for my bonding after all. Besides, our entire invasion fleet is up beyond their weapons. There's no way they can take them down, so there's no way they could win. 
I just wonder how long it's going to be before my rescue team comes through that portal right there. Shouldn't be too long. Though, I, I hope they don't hurt these humans too bad. I know the other ones are bad, but these ones are treating me pretty good. Hmm. Oh, it seems to be taking them a while. 